this is a six week um, community program um, about women's history and um, the history of feminism. So I'm just gonna do a quick introduction. Uh, you'll notice that we've got live transcription. Um, this is in a bid to try and be accessible. It's not always accurate. Um, what I can do afterwards is I'm going to edit the transcription and I can send it out to anyone um, who would like the edited version. Um, also, we're going to ask all the speakers just do a quick visual description uh, when you introduce yourself. So I'm Amy, I'm the programme manager at Newington Green Meeting House. Um, and uh, I'm a white woman and I have blonde hair. I'm sat on a cream sofa with a picture behind me and a white wall. Um, so welcome to Her Stories. And um, this is the programme that we're going to run through. We end at nine. We've done it a bit later in the evening to try and make it accessible for parents um, after some feedback. Um, we're going to be tweeting tonight with the hashtag Her Story. So if there's anything that you'd like to share, you can do it um, on Twitter or on Facebook or Instagram that way. Um, and you can follow us with the links that are in the chat. Um, so just to say a few words about Newington Green Meeting House and the, the programme that I manage there. Um, the Meeting House is in Hackney, um, Islington on the border. Um, and if you... Um, you might have seen it that some um, we had some refurbishment work and restoration work done recently. You hear and, you and it's an amazing building um, which has over 300 years of radical history. And one of our most famous uh, faces is Mary Wollstonecraft, who's kind of credited as being the, the mother of British feminism. And she's inspired this program. Um, and the, the way that we work on the project really is to use our past and stories um, in the past to inspire kind of social change today. I'm gonna hand over to Roshni. Hi everyone, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to Newington Green Alliance and then a, a further introduction to this programme. So um, my name is Roshni, I'm a volunteer for Newington Green Alliance um, for the audio description. Uh, I'm an Indian woman with a dark uh, brown bob haircut sitting on a grey armchair in front of a bookcase. Um, so the Newton Green Alliance, we are a um, community charity and we came together largely over the first lockdown in the middle of the pandemic and um, we kind of grew um, and we currently have over 80 plus volunteers uh, working on a range of different community projects that we hope to kind of aim uh, to strengthen the bonds between the community that we have here. It's extremely diverse. Um, so we, have, we cover everything from um, anti-racism to youth projects, to refugee projects, um, to mental health, um, local news, Turkish speaking, um, and, this, and women's empowerment, which this comes under, uh, and many more that we have kind of running and in, in development. Um, uh, and it's, like it's, it's, it's a really exciting organization to be part of, and I love it. Uh, and we have some of our wonderful volunteers who are helping out this evening as well. Um, and this project in, in particular, Her Stories, this is a collaboration between Newington Green Meeting House and Newington Green Alliance. So Amy and I came together in the wake of the debate generated by the statue for Mary Wollstonecraft on the Green, which is local to this area. And it got us thinking about what feminism means and the stories of the women that have shaped modern feminism in the UK today. We both have a shared passion for women's stories, um, particularly focusing on minoritized groups and their many intersections, so class, race, gender, disability, and so on. And so therefore it was important for us to showcase as wide a range of voices as possible um, we want these sessions to be interactive and accessible to all and promote discussion in a safe, open and inclusive space. So when we're welcoming people from all backgrounds and focusing largely on our Hackney and Islington communities where we're based. And no prior knowledge is necessary. This is a safe space where discussion is open and we want people to come away from these sessions feeling informed, inspired and curious to learn more. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm now going to just introduce you to our first speakers. I'm just going to introduce them by name and then they can introduce themselves better than I can. 
So uh, first up, we have um, Kim and Jumoke from the Triple Cripples. Welcome. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, so my name's Jamoke. I'm one half of the Triple Cripples platform and community that I co-founded with Kim. And we had created um, this coming up to three years ago now, actually, um, as a remedy for quite a lot of bills that are currently happening within the world. So we are focusing on and centering the, um, the needs, the lived experiences and lives of disabled black and non-black women, femmes and non-binary women of color. And we utilize the awesome power of the media as a way of using representation as a stepping stone in order to actually affect positive change in people's lives. So it is not a sake, um, it is not the case of representation for the sake of representation, but rather representation so that people's health care is considered, so that people's access to education, social yeah. mobility, and all of the other wonderful things that um, quite a number of people take uh, for granted and assume to be readily available, that isn't actually readily available for those that aren't actually seen anywhere in any sort of landscape, whether it is within a white majority nation like the UK or even in their own home, in their own home nations where whiteness is seen as the, as the default, it's seen as the pinnacle. So in which way are you able to actually not only survive, but thrive? And that's hopefully where we come in and trying to rid the ills such as racism, sexism, ableism, fat phobia, transphobia, homophobia, and all of these terrible things in the world and actually become more inclusive and include people that have been so marginalized for so long. Um, right, so today we are going to be speaking, oh sorry, no, because I, I said you said it, it all, girl, you said it all. <laughs> so um, today we're going to be talking on the topic of women and work. Now, what is work? So, um, oh, my apologies, I didn't actually give an audio description of where I am. So my name is Jamoke, I am a black woman with um dark purple braids and I am sitting on my bed. I've got a dark brown headboard and I've got uh, green curtains behind me, green and cream curtains behind me. Kim, you go ahead, do that. And then okay, I'm Kim. I am six foot one, but you can't see it right now. Uh, I've got a head of luxurious locks, a pink crop top and a white curtain, I think, or an off-white curtain behind me and a wooden headboard because I'm classy. <laughs> yes, I, I can certainly vouch for that. Um, right, so on the topic of work, what is work? For so often, whenever work is considered and work is discussed, we think of work that produces money, work that makes financial positivity, work that actually enables people to have money in their pockets. But so often the people that have the money in their pockets are those that are at the very top, those that are white, those that are male, those that are non-disabled, those that have for so long taken so much from the world. And when we consider what work is, so much of the work that is prescribed to women that is expected of women is actually work that goes um, unpaid. So unpaid labor, unpaid work within the household and certain assumptions are made and even recently um, the government's advert when they were showing all of the different rooms within the home it was an image of a woman working it was an image of a woman working it was an image of a woman working but when it came time to be on the couch relaxing spending time with the family that's when the man popped up now as um, two black disabled femmes and um, when we consider blackness black people created most of what you see in this entire world the production and the use of labor of enslaved Africans is what created and continues to facilitate nations within the entire world within the west within Europe within America uh, Canada and the Americas so South America included as well and we 
have to consider and try to think of work that isn't just tied intrinsically to that which makes money. Because if we only think of people having value as to how much money that they can make, how much they can benefit the, um, the stock market, for example, then where does that leave Kim and I? Where does that leave people that are visibly disabled? It's just kind of like, well, you have no value because you cannot work, you cannot produce and you cannot make money. And we think that it is absolutely high time that we take away from these capitalist ideas of what we consider to be work. Emotional labor is work. Me sitting um, with a family member, a stranger, whoever, and listening to them, giving them that room, that space in order to be themselves and tell me their troubles, tell me their woes, and also tell me their joys. That's also something that should be considered as work. Work doesn't need to just be something that gives you pounds, that gives you dollars, that creates yen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's interesting, I think it's, is it 98% of the, of caring work in the world is done by women? A 98%. And funnily enough, caring, most caring work is the least paid work on the planet. So if you think about the fact that most of our lives are, um, consist of caring for one another in formal and informal ways, um, the fact that that isn't valued highly already contradicts our ideas of what work is right and what it value is it informs what we consider valuable because we associate value with monetary exchange and so it's kind of redressing the imbalance of value within the society that's what we have to do um, and also Money's made up, so to use money to value human beings and their contributions to the planet or their detractions from the fat planet, it's not often looked at like that, but to use money to value that doesn't inherently make any sense. Um, there, there are things that we understand to be unquantifiable, right? But yet somehow when it comes to this thing that we call work, everything has a price, everything has a number because as Jim Kerr said, it's about production. Um, and, and also, you know, how we view workspaces and what work could look like. Um, we also think that work has to be something that you feel terrible at the end of. Someone is an overseer kind of making sure that you do the thing and you know, I'm tired at the end of the week, I'm uninspired. If it's not that, then it's not work. Do you know what I mean? And just even seeing it in that way is detrimental to everyone. And as Jamal Kerr says, it means that people like me automatically someone will be like, oh no, but they can't contribute anything because they're not someone who I can you know, work to the bone and draw all the blood because they can't physically withstand it. There's the presumption. I mean, I, I can't, but you know, there's the presumption. What if I wanted to, I should be able to if I want to. But there's that idea, right? That somehow because of my physical presentation or my mental health or whatever it is that is deemed to be unworthy, unproductive, unprofitable, that somehow now in the society that has determined people's value based on their GDP or whatever currency they're using, I'm right at the bottom. And when you're right at the bottom, as Jamoka said, like you, there are no provisions made for you in any way, shape or form, whether that's educationally, whether that's medically, whether that's socially, whether that's culturally, whether that's in terms of access, nothing will be, there will be no provisions made for you because you are less important, right? Or not important at all. Um, and, you know, we, we see it happening around us all the time. And we see the implications of it. But I think what folks don't often realize is that it never affects you till it affects you. I think a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's not me. It's never me. I'm not in that fit situation, so it will never be me. And perhaps that's not even a conscious thought, but it's the underlying understanding that that's over there and I'm over here. But what we know from everything, I mean, I'm a George Orwell fan, right? And one of the things that I love about him, him and um, what's her name? The one who wrote the one who wrote that other book, Oryx and Craig. Margaret Atwood. Oh, Margaret Atwood. 
Yeah. Yes, there you go. In some of the books that they write, they talk about there's this gradual progression, right? Everyone thinks that something doesn't affect them until everyone's in some kind of weird dystopian bondage. Um, and in some ways, we're kind of seeing some of that play out now, right? Because everyone's like, oh, what? I can't leave my house? Wow, this is mad. Um, and it's like, they're, disabled people are like, I've been trying to tell you that the health system needs an overhaul. We've been trying to tell you that the way you guys work isn't efficient, you know? And so it's like, it's in some ways now's an opportunity for people to be like, okay, let's rethink this whole thing and overhaul it, right? Um, but yes, it is about redressing an imbalance of value and then structuring the world restructuring the world within your space, right? Because you can't just go to Downing Street and be like, look, do what I say or else. Like you have to work within your community, within your environment, within your home, right? That's where it starts. You can't just say you're part of an organization. You have to make it count in your real everyday life. And so even how you relate to yourself will be reflected in the world around you. Yes, absolutely. And um, having been in the world of work for a number of years, I've seen the ways in which ableism in the world of work actually affects non-disabled people as well. So for a number of uh, roles within a number of organizations and settings, for a worker or an employee to be seen or to be thought of as somebody that's like focused on the job, ready to help, they have to be stood on their feet for eight hours. There is absolutely no need. That is inherently ableist. And what that mm. causes is for non-disabled people, you're inching ever closer to being disabled. Now, for a lot of people, as Kim had rightly mentioned, it's just kind of like, oh, that's an issue for those people over there. It has nothing to do with me. But people don't actually realize how close they are to disability. Like you could just be very well sitting there, not doing anything, you know, going about your day as you please. And then you could just become disabled. So would you, would you not rather have a world in which all of these accommodations have already been made so that you're able to actually hit the ground running and just experience life in a completely different way as opposed to facing all of these various barriers that you never actually noticed before. Mm. You never noticed mm. that actually there aren't that many lifts here. You never actually noticed that the welcome sign isn't actually followed by the welcome attitude. Not if you have crutches, not if you're in a wheelchair, not if you're seen in any way to be a burden. And if we're mm. looking at work in this newfound reality that you know we have, thanks to the global pandemic, disabled people for so long have been asking for um like what's it advocating for remote working we have always been told yet we're not listening of the values that actually come through it's like why do i have to travel for two hours to sit at a chair and desk for eight hours in order to travel back for another two hours to be able to go home sleep eat and repeat there is absolutely no need and we're seeing that the work-life balance was actually not balanced at all. It was completely askew towards people were living to work, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's the ways in which disabled people are ignored until it actually affects non-disabled people. Zoom, having all of these meetings, being able to be present and learning from people from all around the world, we were told that that was not a possibility, but right now, the you know amazing and illustrious universities these huge organizations um your googles your amazons i mean the people in hq they don't actually care about the workers let's keep it very honest um <laughs> they're saying that actually we don't want you to go back into the office and we'll until we're sure that it's absolutely safe but your delivery driver that's okay the postal workers that's okay mm -hmm. so for a lot of the for a lot of people your value is actually tied to the work that you do your value mm. is tied to how much money you make. Your value is tied to your title. So then what yeah. value do you have when you cannot work? Yeah. And that's that's a very good point, Jamalke, because actually, although, yes, a lot of stuff has changed and things have gone online and they seem more accessible, first of all, not everybody has access to the internet, right? Not everybody's job is an uh, office-based job. Um, 
And then also we have to think about the fact that it still ultimately comes down to production because one of the reasons why companies were like, okay, let's go online was because they were like, I still want to get everything I can out for you. And actually there are some people who are working more now because their boss knows they're at home <laughs> than they were when they were going into an office and were able to close the door and leave, right? And so, I think there is there is still a lot of learning to be done. It's not just about having the technological crossover. It's also about facilitating equity of experience. Um, it's also about equal pay. It's also about a, a livable working wage, one that isn't like, okay, I'm paycheck to paycheck. It's about all of those things, viable forms of healthcare, rethinking all of that, uh, sorry, childcare, rethinking how that works, looking at the balance within the homes and who is doing what, who's, and, and how that balances out and what we believe our roles should be based on what we've been taught for however long, based on our cultural values or religious ideas and rethinking all of that stuff. Um, and, and sadly, this whole situation has kind of made us go, okay, we know who are definitely the haves and have nots based on who's actually still at work outside and who's not, right? Um, based on who's dying at alarming rates and who's not, based on all of those things, we are aware of those imbalances. What is yeah. the answer? What, what is it that we are able to do to change these things? How do we, because I think that's a question that a lot of people ask. Okay, so these are all the problems. So, so, so what do I do now? I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and I think- I wish I to, had a wand. <laughs> yeah. And like, just to wrap up, the very reason that the Triple Cripple was created is just to remind people and constantly reiterate that people have value because they are people. Nothing yeah. else matters. So that has been us. That's been me, Jamoke, and Kim Oliver. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Honestly, I could listen to you all night. That was brilliant. Uh, so many, I mean, I, I feel like you guys just talk in sound bites, but um, managed to include, uh, you include so much in what you say. Um, yeah, lots to, lots to discuss later. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to introduce our second speaker now, Sanita. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, you can introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Sundari Anita. I go by the name Anita. Uh, and I'm a professor of gender, violence, and work at the University of Lincoln. And um, I've got long hair. I'm a brown woman, long black hair, or longish black hair, and um, reddish long sleeves and some cream um, patterned curtains at the back. Um, oh, I've forgotten what I was saying about myself. Yeah. So I do research in two areas. I do research on um, violence against women and girls, and I do research on um, work, on uh, women workers, migrant women workers, on um, exploitation and resistance at work. And today, um, can, can someone just, uh, can you type a chat? How many minutes have I got? Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about um, my long uh, ongoing research on um, the Grunwick dispute, which fits kindly picks up on many themes that we've been talking about 15 minutes. Okay, that is, so I shall zip through it um, on many themes that we've been talking about, particularly the intersection of different social um, positionality, social relations of power and how they um, impact on the world of work. And so the earlier discussion was talking about disability and gender. Um, there wasn't such an explicit discussion on race. I am, um, I, you know, I'm pretty certain that um, disability and um, and gender we know from research is is also racialized. And so my um, discussion of the Grunwick dispute um, is also about the intersection of gender, race, and class. And um, so for those of you who don't know, Grunwick uh, dispute was an industrial dispute which took place in the UK in um, 1976. And it took place in a context where trade you unions had a long you history. Know. You okay? Um, trade unions had a long history of not supporting 
uh, migrant workers, of not supporting women workers. And there was a whole, there was a series of industrial action, um, imperial typewriters, but that wasn't the only one, where South Asian women um, took part in strikes in order to um, demand equal pay. And this was a period when um, the pay differentials were not only gendered, but were also racialized. So um, uh, uh, non-white workers received uh, lower rates of pay, and within that, there were gradations. And so um, there were several strikes by uh, South Asian women um, demanding equal pay on account of the gender as well as race, the intersection of the two. What they found was the trade unions were, um, they didn't have to just um, fight the employer, they had to fight their own trade union bosses and often resistance from other fellow workers. So Grunwick dispute is remembered because it, um, it was the first time that um, the British trade union movement for a period at least, supported the cause of migrant women workers. So Grunwick was, uh, let me just keep an eye on the time, was a photo processing plant. So um, in those days, we didn't have cameras, digital cameras. People had these little rolls of films. And um, remember, 70s was when foreign holidays started. So people would go on their summer holidays, post a little roll of film, and then it would be processed, and they'd be sent the photos back. So that's what Grunwick was. Um, it was the uh, factory was um, predominantly um, the workers were predominantly Irish, um, white workers, a, a mix of um, Caribbean workers as well, but predominantly white. Now, in the early seventies, mid seventies, the workforce shifted. There was there was a new category of migrants, which were um, African Asians, so of Asian descent, but from um, African countries. Uh, so they'd been uh, they'd moved there as part of the colonial regime. So there's a, there were layers of hierarchies within the colonial regime where um, the white colonial rulers were at the top, the Asians were in the middle who did the bureaucracy of the colonial administration and as well as the economic uh, um, elements of you know, running banks, businesses, and at the bottom were the black um, uh, Africans. And so they uh, occupied the middling layer in this hierarchy. And when those countries became independent, which, you know, um, to me seems quite um, obvious they tried to reclaim those resources back and um, many Asians uh, sought to they were British citizens they came to the UK and so the Grunwick uh, at that point there was this migration happening and the factory owner replaced the workers with these Asian workers and this is something we see again and again new categories of migrants are constructed as good workers um, on one hand, they construct as good workers, by which mm, you mean more mm, exploitable workers, workers who may not know their rights, who may need to work desperately. At the same time, you also have these constructions of them as scroungers. You can't, it can't both be true. But um, uh, they were, so they were sought after and they occupied that. And mm, very soon, the majority of the workforce in certain parts of the factory were South Asian women. Now they experienced a whole range of exploitative conditions. Um, on account of their gender and race. Um, and class had an important role to play because for them, they were middle class. In Africa, they were the middling uh, layer of that hierarchy. They, were, they had servants. They told me in their interviews uh, that we had servants. We were middle class. We never had to go out and work. The women didn't engage in paid work outside the home, predominant mostly. The few who did, did respectable work. So they'd be um, secretarial posts or teaching they would have never worked in factories. So when they came to the UK, they experienced class dislocation. So for the first time, they had to go out, work in factories. So they had to experience what life was like as a working class person in a low status, low paid job. But there was the added layer of being, mm, uh, of being racialized in a particular way, which they were not used to because they, were the, mm, they had other groups that they racialized as inferior in, from where, you know, their earlier lives. Um, so they experienced particular forms of um, control at work. So for instance, they had to ask for permission to go to the toilets. And this was about the managers were white men. So it was about gender as well as race. And so they felt ashamed um, to um, ask loudly. And this again is something, it, this was a long time back. This was in the 70s. And you see this again. So Trump, for instance, uh, talks about women going to be disgusting, he says. So for men, it's OK that to men's toileting functions are neutral, their bodily need. But for women, there's a certain level of disgust attached to it. So there's a whole gendered construction of our bodily functions. 
which is quite um, interesting to me. Um, and so the women, when they were made to ask loudly, they felt ashamed. And um, so, um, so this was a way of controlling them. There were also other very practical ways in which um, the workplace was oppressive. And this again touches on the previous talk. We all know women have a second shift across the world, and whether they work in full-time jobs just as men. And we're seeing it in, during the pandemic. Women do the majority of housework. And so women in Grunwick also had to, at the end of the day, go home and do their second shift. And often during the peak period in the summer, they would be asked to stay back and do overtime at 7 o'clock. Um, and this was really disruptive for them because they were expected to go home and do their second shift. What would happen then? Um, so one day in August 1976, during the day, um, the factory had, uh, this is a peak period summer, they had temporary workers. So some of them were uh, university students. So a couple of students were laughing as they were working, they were chatting to each other, laughing. The manager turned to them and said, stop chattering like monkeys. This is not a zoo. Now, one of those uh, boys was um, the son of a longtime worker in the factory. Um, later on that day, um, this worker, Jabin Desai, as she was leaving to go home, the manager turned to her and said, um, uh, don't pack up. I need you to do overtime. I need you to stay till 10 o'clock. And there were angry words exchanged. She was waiting to go home. It was a long journey home. There, were, there was work to do at home. And um, she turned to the manager and said, I want to tell you something. What you're running here is not a factory. It is a zoo. In a zoo, you have many types of animals. You have monkeys who dance to your tune. You also have lions who can bite your head off. We are the lions, Mr. Manager. And she said, I've had enough. I want my freedom. And she walked out. And as she walked out, she turned to other workers and said, let me tell you this. He wouldn't treat white workers the way he treats us. So right from the beginning, it was very clear. It was about gender. It was about race. And in many ways, it was about class, which is less recognized. Because for these workers, um, because of that class dislocation, they were affronted at the treatment that routinely meted out to working class people. They felt that their dignity had been disrespected the way they were treated. And so they felt that that treatment that goes with these low status, low um, paid jobs very acutely because this was new to them. So there was that element as well. Anyway, they walked out, joined the trade. They didn't know how to, you know, they'd never done paid work before. Found out about trade unions, joined a trade union. A few months, nothing happened. There were, you know, just a few women workers standing at the factory door. Gradually, they started going up. The trade union, um, uh, they joined the Apex, which was Mm, a small trade union, not quite left of center, so a surprising choice. But um, they got support from tra uh, TUC, Trades Union Cong Congress, right at the beginning. Um, and the first meeting of the Congress where this was put forward to them, it was put forward as an issue of race and of racial discrimination. But the union took this up as a cause of uh, right to join trade unions. They presented that demand and they were sacked. And therefore, it became a struggle about right to join trade union. And in my book, I think, um, so this research was done with um, me and Ruth Pearson, and we think it was because it was framed as a right to join trade union rather than an issue of racial discrimination and where different groups of workers within the factory weren't pitted against each other on grounds of race or gender. I think it was easier for trade union to mobilize. Anyway, they were went to different factories. How are we doing for time? Okay. Uh, can someone type in? Mm -hmm time because I'm not very good at doing timekeeping. They went around asking for support and gradually huge amounts of um, unionist, uh, ordinary workers, teachers, students came, uh, turned up to help uh, support them to join the pickets. In the summer of 77, 20,000 people were on some of these pickets in narrow streets of North London. And this was astounding. This is the 70s, yeah? This is the time. This is 10 years after Enoch Powell's reverse of blood speech. So 1968, Enoch Powell's reverse of blood speech was about immigration, demanding an end to immigration. And at that point, the Dock Workers Union in London, they marched to the parliament with their banner uh, calling for an end to immigration. And just a decade later at the Grunwick dispute, they were on that mass picket, marching with the same banners, asking for rights for migrant workers. So uh, for me, that's a really important moment. Eventually, there were lots of ins and outs. We don't have time to go through that. 
if you want to, you can look at um, our website and I'll tell you, I'll type that when I have a minute, um, for what happened in the strike. Eventually, the Labour government had a wafer-thin majority. The strike uh, was on the front pages all the time. The mass picketing was seen as disruptive. And the Labour government asked the trade unions to rein in the strike. And um, they led them through bureaucratic inquiries and mediation process, whereas the workers wanted mass solidarity, which I think is a strength of workers, yeah? And especially minority workers, minoritized, um, marginalized workers, they draw strength from solidarity and the trade unions didn't want that. Eventually, the workers went on a hunger strike outside the trade union Congress, and the, they weren't successful. And the um, strike was, in 78, the strike was um, declared closed. The workers didn't get what they wanted. But I think it's really important to remember this dispute for several reasons. Firstly, it's also about the construction of South Asian women in the UK. And if you think about the dominant construction of South Asian women, it's as passive as meek, as confined to the domestic sphere. What we really don't see is these is them as workers and as workers who actively fight for their rights, who have secured um, rights that we all enjoy as workers today. We don't see them as active participants in British labor history. So those are the erasures that we need to correct with remembering these accounts. So I think that's important. The second thing is Brexit. At the time of Brexit, white nationalism we are in a period when my workers are being pitted against each other on account of who's migrant, who's um, resident here, on account of race. At this moment, it's really important to remember a time when through that dark period, it was possible for the white working class in Britain to see a common cause with migrant and women workers. So it's possible. For me, it's important to hold on to that hope. And so I think, um, there were some other things that I wanted to reflect on, on what it means for us when we think about history to remember particular women and, and their stories. And we thought a lot about this because there's also a problem with remembering particular women in these struggles and, and making this an account about particular exceptional women because what that also implies is that we're talking about them because they're exceptional and everyone else was um, the contrary, was passive, was not active in the labor market, um, was not um, resisting. And I think there's also a problem about how we celebrate particular individuals. And we've struggled a lot with this idea. I mean, we wrote um, a comic. When we finished our research, we did a book, which all academics do. But I mean, how many people read a book? So we also did a comic um, for um, children, young people. And the first story had to be, I can't find here, yeah, Jayabin Desai, the leader of the Grunwick dispute. But the second story is an amalgamation of different accounts of that uh, people gave us about the other industrial disputes they took part in. And so it doesn't have a named hero. I think there's a problem with um, eulogizing particular individuals because we then forget that um, the many, very many uncelebrated stories of people who, are, who have struggled and, and so, but the world that we live in, people like particular stories. And so it's, it's a dilemma in terms of thinking through what does it say? What does it enable us to do? But what does it also, what are the ways of looking at the past that it also forecloses? So I'll stop there. Anita, um, Anna Birch is asking, where can we buy the comic book? Okay. Oh, there are lots of new messages I can't see. Mm. The comic is not for sale. If you um, send me an email with your address, oh, I used to post it, my work used to post it, but I'll have to do it from home. Um, that's fine, I've got a few stamps. If you send it to me, I'll um, post it out. So it's free, but it's also available. So normally if, if I was back at work, I'd send you more than one copy because uh, my work would post it for me. Um, it's available for download at this place, at this website. Let me just type it. Okay. So it's www.striking-women.org. So if you go to this website, it's this website we created again to take the story to young people. We've organized it according to the national curriculum. So there's a section on migration, a section on the history of women and work. There's a section which is called rights and responsibilities at work. 
because that's what the PHSCE curriculum calls it, though it's mostly about the rights. There's a tiny bit about responsibilities there. Um, and there's a section on our research, and it's got the comic, which is downloadable as well. So you can use it. I mean, the website's had some 2.75 million visits. So it seems to be, yeah, something's going well there. Um, so the messages don't automatically upload. So if you've got any questions for me, and yeah, if anyone has some questions, we've got a couple of minutes before we go out into the breakout room. So you can write them in the chat if you want, and we can read them out for you. Um, or in this next, you know, two minutes before we go into the breakout rooms, if you want to just unmute yourself and ask, that's absolutely fine. Um, and in the meantime, I'd just like to say uh, thank you, Tanita, for that. that was really interesting. Um, uh, Roberta's asking a question about um, can you see where the engagement on the website is coming from? She says, e.g., yeah. India, East Africa, UK. Yeah, it's across the world. So um, the biggest countries are UK, USA. There's lots of um, from Canada. India is a big one. Um, but it's pretty much after the first four or five, which are big, it's pretty much across the world. So the numbers are... I haven't looked for a few months, but roughly we get around sixty to 80,000 a month more in. When the schools were open, we'd get a lot more in um, this whole pattern. So February, March, April, May, you'd get high number of visits. Once the holiday started, it would go down. So I think it's, there must be a reflection of the you know the number of visits from the, from the global north. Can I actually say something? Mm -hmm. um, just briefly, I'm a, I'm an old white Scottish woman. I was one of the founder members in the 70s of the women's movement in Birmingham. And I'm still working. And for all you lassies, I like being old because I didn't have to worry about growing old. But I'm still out there working. Have you ever thought, all of you, doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, or what your ethnicity is, you're going to have to face age. And one of the things you haven't mentioned talking about work is ageism. And by God, I'm still fighting it. I'm 76 years old, but I've still got a job hanging on by the skin of my teeth. And I'm not working from home. I'm actually working out there um, because I think that's where we have to start is out there. Um, and I've been doing it all my life. But I just like to say, there is another dimension to all of this in the working world that you're going to have to face. Mm. And that's working and growing old and facing ageism. And you're going yeah. to have to get on board. Anyway, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. So our research had two parts, and the second part was on um, the Gate Gourmet Industrial Dispute, which was an um, aging workforce of Punjabi women. And so some of the issues they faced was on account of age as well. So we do. But, you know, you can't talk about everything. So thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to drop us all into breakout rooms now. So um, I'll say thank you to the speakers because it's completely up to you if you want to join us or, or if not. Um, so thank you just in case you're, you're going now and uh, I will drop us into rooms now. Um, so I think that we are all back. Um, so Roshni, do you want to get the groups to feedback? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to start with our group because I know who was in that. So Shira, would you like to feed back? We were talking, um, Eliani, do you have the question to hand actually? Oh, you're muted, you're muted. Sorry, we were talking about um, tokenistic practices when it comes to the workspace. Um, yeah, th thanks, Elaine, uh, Rashini. Uh, so we we had a we pinged across some ideas of um, what we thought it meant. Um, there are words to describe what tokenism in the workplace is, but actually your feelings and and what that's like. And we talked about um, how quite often for some of us, um, 
we were often brought into places uh, to be like the voice of all the other people or the other minoritized people as if we know what everyone else is thinking. But then also, how do you, when you do get a seat at the table, how do you balance, um, how do you ask all the questions that you need asking and how do you shift that power balance of what the board level and people at the top of that hierarchy looks like? So we were also looking at sometimes, so I give an example of the environmental sector right now because it's George Floyd's murder, I'm getting lots of call outs. Do you want to be part of this interview panel? And then also actually balancing and knowing that it's also because we are experienced people and it isn't because of gender and race only, it's because we, 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 you know, we work really hard to be here and it, that also is a thing and we don't need other voices to tell us otherwise. Um, but also once having um, a seat at the table and demanding those questions and making sure everybody listens to you, you've got that space and time and mic and how best you might use it and change the narrative. Um, and then we talked about growth and uncomfortable questions and how you, we might want to ask some questions and where learning happens in our uncomfortable growth. Elaine, Rashina, does that make sense? Do you want to come in? No, that's great. Thank you. And we have, we have Daisy's group next. Yes. Um, yeah, so we had a really interesting conversation about um, when in trade unions and workplaces, often the officer for women's issues and BAME issues is a woman or a BAME um, person, and what are the pros and cons of that? Um, so we thought of kind of quite a few different points, had a really good discussion. Um, we were kind of thinking that um, from a pro perspective, it's often nice to speak to someone who has a, might have had a similar experience or someone that you feel comfortable talking to, or like a familiar face. Um, also, uh, we were saying how it's kind of dependent on the nature of the issue and whether it's something you'd be comfortable talking to someone, like we were saying from a, from a female perspective, is it something we'd be comfortable talking to a man about? Um, also then we were saying how we wouldn't want to exclude people from spaces because there wasn't that kind of support. So um, especially when you kind of intersect um, gender and um, race with religion as well, um, women, especially women with certain religions might not feel comfortable talking to men about certain issues. Um, then kind of on the other side, the cons of having that, we said, you kind of run the risk of creating an echo chamber and um, creating a situation where the, those problems are seen predominantly as women's problems or problems for people, uh, blame people, and it doesn't kind of address that they're potentially wider problems within that community that need to be addressed um, on a more kind of broad level. Um, yeah, and also just kind of I think Deborah said something about fresh ideas and kind of getting different perspectives on things. And again, if you're kind of excluding these issues into certain um, groups, with certain characteristics, is that kind of limiting our way of kind of overcoming those issues? Um, I think those were our main points, Benjamin or um, Deborah. Is there anything else? That's yeah. great. Cool. Thank you, Daisy. Um, and then we've got Anais, your group. Um, it was me and Anya, and she will speak first. Yeah, so we were kind of discussing activism in the workspace and what role activism has. So my kind of first thought was activist art and what that role has and in um, kind of announcing and denouncing issues in the workspace. So... Um, I did, I'm doing my dissertation on women in work, the art piece, and they went into, into a, a private workspace and publicly um, displayed uh, their findings against women and what that kind of meant for them. And um, yeah, it just, it, it was a really interesting kind of look into allowing women into the workspace and um and into the public space to be talked about um, and which hadn't been done before and art is also a kind of universal language as well it's not when it's not text-based <laughs> excluding text-based work it kind of brings a more emotive element to a protest and a personal and maker's hand into a, a protest and it's universally interpretable so we're discussing that and also kind of modern modern protesting as well so the kind of use of um what they called 
not surveys um petitions 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 um and online petitions and being able to kind of quickly add your voice and to be heard in like a in a parliamentary debate and that kind of yeah that the modern way of a protesting is all digitalized and more accessible you could say now yeah exactly yeah. exactly yeah. brilliant thank you so much and then we had one more group amy were you in that last group or because louise was leading that she had to drop off Oh, yes. Um, yes. Um, so we were talking about Jackie Weaver <laughs> and the Hanforth Parish Council meeting and um, how we were appalled but not surprised um, towards the behaviour that she had to put up with um, that we've all experienced on some level that kind of having to massage egos and deal with misogyny. And uh, I think that you know, um, we spoke, yeah, so one, you know, the, the solidarity from women that have experienced that. Um, and two, the rest of the conversation was kind of speaking about how we uh, feel the need to like temper emotions in the workplace and that um, we're held to a, a different account to men. So for example, if you're not happy, smiley, um, one day, you know, um, you're gonna get a different reaction to a man in the workplace who perhaps, um, you know, people just think, oh, he's just having a bit of a bad day or whatever, or, oh, that's just what he's like, he's grumpy, but we, we're not held to the same account and how difficult that can be um, when you're constantly having to do the emotional labor and uh, check yourself and are you overreacting and can you say that that was misogynistic because what if someone else has a different interpretation of that and then what if you become the aggie feminist in the workplace so we were talking about um, all those kind um, of issues and the main focus really was on like the emotional labor that's kind of expected a bit like Kim and Jamake mentioned that it's expected of you as kind of a woman in the workplace. Thank you so much. Um, really great conversation. So sorry, we've gone over. Um, it's because our speakers were so wonderful. We didn't want to stop them. <laughs> um, next week we have got, what's our topic next week? So Angela, if Angela's here, um, Angela is speaking next week. Thank you for joining us this week, Angela. So we've got Angela Neustatter, who's a, a Guardian journalist, a former Guardian journalist, and she's written books on feminism. Um, and um, we're hearing from Angela, and we're also hearing from Pragna Patel, who's the founder member of Southwell Black Sisters. And they're going to be speaking about different types of feminism. Um, so um, especially focusing on that period in the 1970s, and and um, you've got different groups, different types of feminism, and we're going to be exploring um, that, the commonalities and the differences. Yeah, sure, should be another great discussion. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us today and interacting. Uh, here's the um, poll. If you could just take one minute to fill that in, that'd be really great. And if you haven't already signed up for next week, please do. We love having you here. Great, and, yeah. wonderful. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Uh, it's the same Zoom link, if that helps anyone, you can just save the Zoom link and then we'll see you next time, next week. Thanks thank everyone. You so much, everyone. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank Cheers. You. Bye.